Hello, it's Dr. Day Storms. In this next section, we're going to be talking about valence bond theory and just a little bit into the molecular uh, orbital theory. We're not going to be covering bond order necessarily in, in this class. You can save that for higher level chemistry classes. Okay, valence bond theory actually relies a lot, upon, uh, a lot upon the hybridization, and we've been doing this in class with re without really specifically stating, oh, this is valence bond theory. Okay, so hybridization is very important in this. And there are two ways in order that um, the orbitals can overlap to form bonds, essentially according to this. And one is this idea of sigma bonds. And sigma bonds are that head-to-head -head overlap of the orbitals. Okay, so we had, this is what we've been doing so far in class. And in the last, um, last lecture or video where we have this orbital region overlap. Okay, and so it could either be between two spheres, like in the hydrogen hydrogen and in the diatomic hydrogen, or like what we've seen with with hydrogen and chloride, or chloride and chloride. Okay, and so there's a symmetry to to all of that. <clears throat> the second way that you can actually have orbital overlap actually is not this head-to-head -head kind of sigma bond, but it's a side-to-side -side overlap, and that's because the, and you have to realize, and these are called pi bonds, and they are due to the overlap of these p orbitals, okay? And you have to realize that one set of dumbbells interacting with another set of dumbbells is actually only a, a single pi bond, okay? And so you have that electron density of both above and below the node, that internuclear axis there. So this is not two pi bonds. This is a single pi bond. Okay, I don't want to get that confused with a single bond, but it's a single pi bond. Okay, and it's due to the p axis, uh, not p axis, but the p side orbital overlap. Okay? Now, whenever we discuss single bonds... They're almost always sigma bonds, and that's because the sigma overlap is greater, and so there's a stronger bond and there's more energy in it. That being said, whenever there's multiple bonds, one of the bonds is always going to be a single bond, and the rest of them are, I'm sorry, was it going to be a sigma bond, and the rest of them are going to be pi bonds. And so that's why, as I was mentioning in class on this last week, is every time that you see a double bond, one of them, and here, let me change this color. One is going to be a sigma, and one is going to be a pi bond. Whereas if you have a triple bond, we have one sigma and then two pi bonds. Okay? <clears throat> so this goes a, a long distance to actual, or a great distance to, to explain what happens when you have multiple bonds in a molecule. And so here, this is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is the simplest of the aldehydes. And you'll learn a lot about aldehydes and ketones and other functional groups like that in organic chemistry and biochemistry. But first off, you should be able, by this point in time, figure out that around this carbon, it's going to be sp2 hybridized because there are one, two, three orbital domains. Okay? And so what happens, and I can't do it justice by drawing it, but your books do a much better job than I ever can, is we see the fact that we have a sigma, a sigma, and one of these bonds are, is a sigma. So here we have the sigma between the hydrogen and the carbon, and between that hydrogen and the carbon, and between the carbon and the oxygen. Then we do have this one pi bond right here, because you get the overlap, and that's what makes the double bond a double bond. Okay, now please note, these are non-bonding orbitals, or non-bonding electrons, uh, and around the oxygen, and it too, they are also sp2 hybridized because that oxygen had three electron domains around it. Okay, the unhybridized p orbitals are what cause the, the pi bond to occur. <clears throat> In triple bonds, which I do have another video where I explain this in greater detail, but in triple bonds, such as acetylene, which is also called ethyne, we actually have two of the sp orbitals, and then we have 
two pi bonds. Okay, and this comes from this this idea that see we have an sp orbital here between carbon and hydrogen and carbon and hydrogen and one of the bonds in the triple bond, but the other two bonds are due to this p overlap. I'm going to do one in that color and one in this color right here. So then we've got the back and the front. Okay, so that's what makes a triple bond a triple bond. <clears throat> we can also use this kind of overlap in order to, dis to de describe the reasons why resonance structures occur. Okay, remember when we talked about nitrate and we drew the Lewis structures for nitrate, there were actually three possibilities. Okay, you could have it was a double bond and two single bonds. You could have the double bond in, you know, on this top, the left, or the right, oxygen. And then the other two oxygens would have been pos uh, negatively charged, and the nitrogen in the middle is positive charge. Then we, we discussed last chapter, too, the fact that this electron density is actually being shared. So those two negative charges are actually being shared between all three oxygens. Okay, and that it more accurately reflects the structure of um, of these oxygens and of the electrons that are being shared between between them. Okay, and so if you drew it just like the way that we've been talking about, where you have one pi bond and then the rest of them are all sigma bonds, it really wouldn't accurately describe... It would, we would have one bond that was shorter than the other two, but in reality, they're all three equal. And so they really look like they are all sharing this overlap. And so the reason why this can happen is the fact that the pi bonds, or the p orbitals between all four atoms are really so close together and so we can actually have this delocalization where the electrons are flowing throughout all the molecule there okay and so you really get this this delocalization of the electrons between the three oxygens around that central nitrogen it's really cool looking and it's especially cool the fact that um, whenever we look at something like benzene okay this is really, really awesome if you ever see the electron density of benzene. And so what benzene looks like, benzene is a ring structure. It's got six carbons, okay? It's struck, I mean, it's formula C6H6. So many times, the way that we draw it is, is like this. And in organic chemistry, you'll see that we draw it like this hex nut because we, we talk about the fact that the electron density is delocalized. But I think that it, they really lose the way that, what, what that really means. And so if we just looked at the sp2 hybridization, so if you took benzene and we turned it to where we were looking straight down the molecule... And so we're looking straight down it, and we can see the six carbons here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, and how they have the six hydrogens hanging off. Now if we rotate that, you know, 90 degrees, we would be able to see the p orbitals. And if you see all six p orbitals of the carbon are, are the same distance from each other. So what happens there is that they all are sharing these this electron density. And so we get this complete delocalization. Let me change the color. We get this complete delocalization both above and below the the plane of this the carbons. Okay? And so that's why they really truly are alternating double bonds in the sense that they aren't an individual double bonds, the electrons are being completely shared, and this really adds to the stability of the molecule. Any time that you can have resonance, you increase its stability. That's very, very important. Not only here, 
but um, also in organic chemistry and biochemistry, we talk a lot about, you know, resonance equals stability. Okay? So, for the most part, we're not going to talk, no, this is called an aromatic, when in organic chemistry, later on we do discuss a little bit about anti-aromaticity, but it's a completely different topic. Now, Valence bond theory actually explains a lot about the way bonding can occur. However, if you remember, electrons have both a particle nature and a wave nature to themselves. And so, there are times that the valence bond theory falls a little short in, in explaining. And so, let's just go back and let's discuss waves. Because I don't know if everyone or who all's had, you know, has had uh, experience with waves and the wave nature and what that means with respect to physics. And so, for example, let's say that we have two electrons that are waves. I'm going to try my best to draw these. Okay, there's one, and we'll do another one, similar color, but just a little off. Oh, not too shabby. Okay. Okay, there's another. Let's go back up here. <clears throat> Alright, so if we treat them as waves, remember we had uh, wavelength, which, you know, this would be one full wavelength. We talked about amplitude would be like the height that the wave was. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Alright, so we can have what's called constructive and destructive interference. So when we take these two here, you literally just have to add the the crests and the troughs together, and when those two come together, they will actually result in an even stronger, since let's say that that's x and that's x height, you now have 2x, and this is called constructive interference. However, on the other extreme, we have one going down when the other one, the other wave is going up. And so that would be if one's positive x, one's negative x, it's going to actually, and I can't even hardly draw this one, um, it's going to be destructive, and so it's literally going to be like zero, because as one goes up, the other one goes down the same amount, and it's called destructive interference. So one of them, and when this one, in this first situation, we have something that's additive, that's constructive, and in the second situation, we have something that's destructive, because it subtracts from one another. Because this is going down, while this one's going up, and so it's going to result in a zero, zero sum. Okay, that's about the wave theory. So how does that result when we were talking about bonding? And so, as I mentioned before, valence bond discusses, I mean, it, it for the most part, it talks of, it, it describes everything adequately, but then there are some concepts that just, it just spells at. And when we're talking about it with the wave nature, whenever they interact constructively, and so they, they edify each other, it's going to actually result in a lower bond energy. And so, in this instance here, we have something that the resulting orbital, it's called the bonding orbital, it's a sigma bond, because we're just talking about two hydrogens here, and so they have that perfect overlap. However, if the two electrons are not in sync with each other, where one's going up and the other one's going down as a wave, you're going to get what's called an antibonding orbital. Okay, and this is not kosher. Okay, and so they notice that they actually denote it with this sigma star. Okay, that little asterisk lets you know that it's an antibonding. And so it's actually much higher in energy than the bonding orbital. So the bonding orbital, the sigma one, is the the preferred one. It's lower in energy, and you always want to be lower in energy than higher in energy. 
And so this is molecular orbital theory, is this idea that instead of just doing an individual bond between the valence of one nuclei with another nuclei, you actually mix them together and you get these molecular orbitals. And so it's really easy, they're one and the same when we're talking about hydrogen, but it's whenever we start to get these higher level, like formaldehyde and some of these higher level molecules, that we have these molecular orbitals for the bonding that can occur. So in hydrogen 2, the two electrons will go into the, the bonding molecular orbital, that's the preferential one, where they are constructive and they edify each other. So that's what this is depicting here, is that we have the first hydrogen and the second hydrogen, one's got to spin up, one's got to spin down, and since, you know, uh, they are constructive in their wave nature, they're going to actually bond into the bonding orbital. Okay, and the technically what they call the bond order, it's one half the difference between the number of bonding and the antibonding electrons, but we're not going to really cover it in any greater detail in this class. Uh, we'll save that for the higher level chemistry classes. So hopefully you get an idea of what molecular orbital theory is and how it deals with the wave nature of the overall of the electrons and the overall molecule and the valence bond theory, which is what we've been doing thus far, really about the overlap between the adjacent nuclei, uh, or adjacent a uh, atoms, I should say, their electron orbitals. I'll see you in class.